Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar, Life After Lockdown. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you to Diane, Sh Diane Shelton, who is the CEO of Forethought. Welcome. Thanks, Emily. Nice to see you this morning. Fantastic. So, Diane, I just want to start off by asking you, if you were at a, a dinner party or a barbecue and someone asked you, what do you do? Because your background is quite interesting it's um it's varied and when I, when I first started speaking to you I was fascinated so what do you what do you tell people that you do well I guess it's, it's interesting you say that Emily I, I think it's very difficult to define precisely what it is at, at heart I'm just extremely curious about people um so I've been able, fortunate enough to be able to deploy that into um into a profession so I'd say that my primary focus is really on understanding um, consumer psychology and buyer behaviour. I'm fascinated by the way people operate as individuals and within groups, and that's pretty much um, what we're talking about. But able to deploy that into understanding that behaviour in terms of marketing um, and in terms of business outcomes. I've also spent time inside large organisations and used it for managing, managing teams as well. So at the heart of it, yes, I have a very, very strong understanding of markets, consumers and uh, the dynamics that operate between those areas. Amazing. I'm so excited about this presentation today. I think it's uh, really good timing for this research and I cannot wait for for you to kick this off. Uh, is it true you're also a, a lecturer at the university? Uh, yes, I've done quite a bit of work at uh, Melbourne Business School. So uh, they're ranging from, at one stage, strategic HR, which was very much around um, managing people within the work, workplace, but also in terms of um, organisational behaviour. So they're the two areas that I, I used to uh, spend a fair bit of time lecturing in as well. Amazing. I'm so excited. So just to place everyone, we'll probably go for about 45 minutes. Um, I'm sure Dan could actually talk about this all day long, but we'll try and keep it to 45 minutes. And then at the end, there will be an opportunity to ask um, questions. So um, if you do have a question, just put it in the comment section and I will put those to Diane for you. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Diane and she can kick off. Great. Thanks very much, Emily. I want to start with the title, Life After Lockdown, is obviously something that we're uh, looking to and, and aspiring to understand. Um, and one of the key questions, and we're not out, we're not after lockdown yet, we've got some releases happening, but we believe there's still got a long way to go in terms of the overall impacts of what's been happening to us and continues to happen to us through the pandemic and now through the economic crisis. But the consumers are, as consumers and as individuals, that we are being affected in a number of different ways. And one of the key things from our perspective is understanding what does this mean in terms of how brands and businesses react. Just go to the next slide. Um, before, um, I can't see the slides. I'm hoping you're on the second slide. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, before we go into um, what we're seeing, what we've seen, uh, and, and how we've gone about that, I want to just remind us all of you know what just happened. We've got a picture here of an Australian in a check shirt with a backpack. But the difference is he's wearing a mask and his eyes are very anxious. Um, this is a really good sort of um, view of. We would have felt this is quite an unusual thing to see on our streets even 12 weeks ago. But now this is something that we're seeing much more commonly and uh, understanding where that came from is, is really important. We're 11 weeks, uh, our firm's 11 weeks online and counting um, and we're not seeing any, any signs of our business coming back into the office any, in the CBD of Melbourne anytime soon. So um, it's, it's worthwhile just thinking about you know, where we've come from uh, as well as where we are now and where we might need to go. So looking at the next slide, just a little sorry, bit of background. Sorry, Diane, can I just interrupt you? We've just got a few comments saying that they can't get any sound. And oh, okay. The screen is frozen. So for everybody who's watching, can you just please um, chuck us a comment to let us know whether that's an individual person thing, this has happened to me before, or whether you can all hear and see what's going on. So if you could all just make a comment, that would be amazing. Mm. 
So we've got quite a few people all sorted. Okay, David sorted. Is anyone else? Okay, they're okay now. All right, sorry about that. Just some tech difficulties. No, no, it's very important. This is in this new Zoom age. I'm using Zoom there as a generic uh, statement, not not around the the brand. Um, yeah. We're all learning how to how to manipulate and manage our microphones and our cameras. Okay, yeah, we had some technical issues before we started, but we got yeah, them. So, we did. so, all right, here's right. the next slide. Okay, so just going back, as I said, you know, this is a very uh, strange period for all of us, and so. Back in mid-March, when we decided that it was a matter of, of when, not if, we all went online as our business. We've got about 80 people in the business. Um, so it was a fairly big decision to make. Um, we also uh, became to the realisation that, that we what we were looking at was not just the flu. So, you know, there was quite a lot of um, phony war talk going on at the time. So at that point in time, we decided to set up a continuous tracking program. Um, we wanted to provide ourselves and our clients with some lines in the sand around how we should be functioning or what we should be doing. I mean, I'm sure like many other businesses out there, we were poised to do a number of big projects. Um, they were about to kick off. There were some things that were in stage. Should we keep going? Is this normal? What, what are we going to find out there? So we decided it was very important for us to start um, understanding and tracking what was going on. And what we did there was look at... at um, three key areas. We didn't want to just do a descriptive statistic, a descriptive survey that just told us what we already knew, that people were anxious and this was a pretty bad thing and it was we were all feeling abnormal. What we wanted to do was look at the interplay, as I said before, the dynamic between how normal do I feel and what's going on here and how does that change week by week? What's my emotional state and the emotional state of Australians and uh, what does that mean in terms of how I feel in terms of normality, what I'm feeling day to day and what I do in terms of uh, purchase behaviours and indeed um, just general behaviours as a, as a, a person. So around normality, uh, there, rather than just asking a series of questions, we created a model. So we asked questions and used statistical um, analytics to understand what were the key drivers of normality. And I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit more. What it does, though, is give us an understanding of when the trigger points are for returning to normal. Um, and what are the kinds of things we should be looking out for? So the lead indicators of when normality is returning. Um, emotions is another area that's extremely important. We've been tracking emotions in a um, in a an inferred way, i.e., not by asking emotions, but by using again analytical devices to understand people's emotions, feeling for about eight years in Australia. So we were able to create a pre-COVID. Um, um, analysis of what the resting state of Australians' emotions were around nine key emotions. And these are the key emotions that are associated with behaviour, particularly consumer behaviour. And by that, we were able to look at pre-COVID and then week by week what was going on with the, with the key emotional um, uh, indicators and what the behavioural consequences. And then, of course, we wanted to understand around the, the intent to switch, trust, advocacy, what are the kinds of things that were impacting on our behaviour. Um, and the reason, as I said, you know, that, that we did this was that we would know when to recommence research. There's no point in going out and doing strategic research in a really abnormal uh, time, and, and nor is it appropriate to be setting up and modelling on the basis of, of, of behaviour which is abnormal at that time. But also we had a lot of clients who were in war rooms, particularly in that first stage, um, early March, where mid-March to you know early April, where we're in react and respond, we're all kind of hit over the head at the same time. So in that situation, we had people who were needing to make very fast on the run decisions about what to say, how to say it. And in those circumstances, um, we felt it was important for our clients to have a, a form of structured data coming in every week that was giving them a context. Because often in your own environment, you can be overwhelmed by what you're seeing and not necessarily see the, the bigger picture. And finally, to make sure that our clients were then looking at and understanding the mind and mood and adjusting the messaging um, and knowing whether or not they had to make some big changes in, in what they were doing out there. So um, we have a look at the next slide. At the start of the pandemic, we were in a situation where we, we did this normality index and the key driver of normality for Australians was, you know, 25% of the overall driver of normality was my feeling comfortable to be out in public. Um, and my ability to make future plans. This is really a significant. It was around those personal freedoms were the strongest drivers. And if you remember back, 
this is a very unusual situation in that there's no them and us in this. All of us, whether we're in business or anywhere else, all of us suddenly were not able to do what we were planning to do. We couldn't go to that wedding. We couldn't go to that party. We certainly couldn't go on that trip. Um, I was planning to be in Korea in April. Obviously, that disappeared very, very quickly. Um, and we were stuck at home. So that notion of personal freedom and our ability to step outside was taken away from us. The other thing you need to remember at the start of the pandemic also was we were seeing photographs of very vivid um, pictures of people dying in Italy. And we didn't know what this virus was gonna do here. We didn't know how hard it would be. We didn't know whether our hospital systems would cope. So that fear of being comfortable out in public was two-toned. One was about uh, comfortable to be there because you were safe and the other one was um, just a, a railing against the kinds of restrictions. Not really railing, but the business of being stuck at home suddenly and without any kind of, uh, it's a little bit like being sent to your room in a, in a way, but all of us being sent to our, our rooms at exactly the same time. However, if you look at the next slide, what we're seeing is that we've moved through the, the health crisis and the two things that have had a big impact on our feelings about the health crisis have been the, um, the flattening of the curve. And we talked a lot about that in the early days and, and obviously we had very high success as a country in flattening the curve. And also the, the releasing of restrictions, um, which we've been seeing over the last four or five weeks. So we saw by about week six, week five, week six, we remodelled those drivers of normality. Now we see that feeling confident in the economy has become the strongest driver. This is not surprising at all because we've basically come through, we're more comfortable about the health issues that we had, but now we're in a situation where we're turning around and looking down the barrel of um, the impact. And we know that over 44% of, of households in Australia have been affected from an income perspective and 100% has been in, impacted, at least in the short term, from a, a, an asset base, so our superannuation, the value of our homes, etc. We're also looking at a situation where um, JobKeeper, which is a, an artificial subsidy on salaries, will be coming off. We're not quite sure when or how, but, but potentially coming off for a lot of businesses at the end of September. We don't know what that will mean in terms of people being able to meet those um, salary requirements. So we've moved from this initial react and respond phase where we were uh, basically bowled over by what had happened and all really dealing with the implications of that at home in our personal lives as well as with um, our business lives to say, oh, I'm not totally over the health scare yet, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I do believe as an Australian community we can manage the health the health issues. I won't totally be relaxed about that until I have a vaccine, but, but we can manage it. So my personal freedoms have also been um, released more because we've had the restrictions slowly being released and in some states more than others, and you can see that in the data that we have. But now I'm beginning to think, oh, how am I going to deal with the economic repercussions? And it's a different kind of thing. The health crisis was something that we didn't really know much about. Economic recessions, we do know a fair bit about. Um, and uh, it, it's something that we um, need to be prepared for. So people, and, and it does have an impact on the way that, that we might behave. So we've moved as um, individuals into a different state of mind around normality, but we're also moving as businesses into understanding when I've, I've reacted and responded, now I'm having to rethink, what do I need to do differently? So if we go to the next slide, um, here is just a map. If you see on the, on the uh, axis on the um, left-hand side, you've got 100% at the top there is, I feel 100% normal, I think life's normal. So at the start, we had a situation where we were, you know, 36, we felt we were 36% of the way up to normal, i.e. we thought, you know, it was close to 64% um, abnormal, which was you stay home. So the borders were closed, restrictions started. Um, JobKeeper came in, we get quite, quite flat between the first two weeks there. And these are weekly numbers. Don't normally see this kind of um, movement over weeks in many, in many statistics. And we had JobKeeper, which enabled people to say, right, I can, I can maintain my, my teams, which is good additional hardship support. And then what you see around the 19th of April is the curve starts to flatten. And then we start to feel a little more comfortable, um, restrictions start to ease, and then we're, we're heading back up early access schemes um, and restrictions easing most in most states and, and Victoria to follow on June the 1st. So this, this was up to the 25th of May. Um, what we did see uh, is, say, in Western Australia, they started actually lower in terms of normality. West Australians were really nervous and worried initially. 
Um, but they're now well up into the 60s um, in terms of normality. Victorians are probably the lowest in terms of, of the normality reading at the moment. We're still still 40% below what we thought was normal, and that's fair enough because we still can't travel uh, the way we wanted to. Uh, there's still border restrictions. So um, what we've seen there is that kind of movement uh, from normality, and it related very much, as I said before, to the combination of feeling that we're managing the health crisis and that we're able to do more things that, that, than we used to do before. The second area on the next slide was the area around emotions. So um, here, they provide a very different lens. You've got a web there on the right, which is showing you in the uh, white, you've got the benchmark. So remember I told you we've done eight years worth of this research. Fundamentally, that benchmark and the emotions there, surprise, happiness, love, pride, contentment, the positive emotions are the ones that are most highly correlated with making decisions and behaving. When people um, make decisions, they actually generally need an emotion to detonate that decision making. And here we have, um, as I said, that resting state of calibration. And it's very consistent over time. It really changes. So our analysts were really quite concerned about whether we'd see any change at all, but we did. That blue line is that first week we took this study, which was back in, in late March. And what you see there is a major um, decline in all the positive emotions, which are associated with, you know, making decisions, consumer confidence, buying things. And we've seen a massive increase in the negative emotions, particularly anxiety. None of this is surprising. It's quite intuitive, but it gives you a very different lens. So if you're thinking about trying to sell to people or you're thinking about people building a house or any of those other kinds of things, you're seeing anxiety actually is a real impediment to clear decision making, which I think is, is fairly normal. What we saw in these early weeks was the hoarding and the chaos and the uh, anxiety and people pitted against one another to some degree. And that was driven by this anxiety. So you do get that fight or flight type of thing. You get that it's me and my family and I need to protect we did some qualitative work, sort of um, anthropological, sort of rapid ethnography, we call it, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, during this time too. And we asked people to bring in an item that online, bring an item to the table that they, you know, that really meant something to them through this period. And we had one woman, um, single parent with two children, and she bought an axe. And now it wasn't, she wasn't going to cut anyone's heads off. She was using the axe to sort of uh, store wood and things like that and protecting her family. But it also had a really strong symbolic meaning is as the act. So that fighting um, period was was really strong. And you can see that's an emotional profile which is aggregated across the community. It's not an individual's. But if you look at the next slide, what we see though is that by week six, we're recovering very quickly. So the again, the white line is the benchmark, which is where we normally sit. And then we're seeing that we've had a big increase in the uh, positive emotions and a, a decline in the negative emotions. Uh, positive emotions have gone up faster than the negative emotion has declined. But also with the positives, the first one we saw move was love. And what we saw through those first few weeks after the hoarding, we started to get the community spirit going again, people coming out, helping, buying shopping for people, um, taking the garbage out, wearing fancy dress, um, just a general sense of we're all in this together. And rather than where uh, we have limited supplies to manage, we're all in this together and we're helping one another more than we were before. It was also very helpful that, that the brands, the supermarkets actually got organised very quickly to communicate. They communicated very strong, very, very um, rapidly. They set up special times for vulnerable groups to shop and tried and also um, set in place restrictions on, on purchasing so that we had, um, you know, a, a belief that we could share and that we wouldn't end up uh, without our toilet paper, which was, I know, quite an interesting thing, but very symbolic of that. So if we go to the, the next slide, we'll see that while we've improved and we're continuing to improve, so now you're actually seeing week nine in terms of that green line, you can see is almost back to normal on all the positive emotions. But we've actually seen still for anxiety is lagging. Um, and that to me makes absolute sense, but it's nice to actually be able to have some data behind that, that anxiety is something which is um, now working more in terms of the economic issues than the health issues, but the anxiety is remaining. So this is where it becomes interesting and important for us to understand what are the things that allay or assuage anxiety. Initially, it was the flattening of the curve. What does that mean from an economic point of view? What is it, what is it going to take to have Australians feeling less anxious and therefore less um, concerned about committing themselves to uh, behaviours which were positive for the economy 
as we go through. So um, that was the, those were the things that, that were important around how normal do I feel and what's happening to my emotional state as we work through this uh, process. But if you go to the next slide, we'll see that through the process for categories, so we've been doing this at a category level, not a brand level, the category is managing the message has been critical. So these are the outcomes, the behaviours. So we've been, again, tracking, um, you know, we have pre-COVID benchmarks for things like um, advocacy uh, and also contestable loyalty. In other words, my, my, my desire to switch. What you're seeing here is a pretty strange set of graphs for us. This is superannuation, mainly industry, well, superannuation is a category, which is mainly industry super now, and on the right, the banks. Now, you know, six months ago, those those scores would have been reversed. You see that the superannuation guys are starting fairly high up there, out, out of ten on on both advocacy and and loyalty, um, and then they everyone takes a big deep deep drop. At, well, the the bank one doesn't in, on this particular slide, but you know, during the royal commission and post royal commission, we've seen a very different set of of numbers. But managing the message has been really critical. What we've seen here is superannuation as a category has taken a big hit. There's been a lot of negative media. There hasn't really been a lot of uh, countering of that necessarily by the category. Again, I'm not talking brands here. Certain brands have been um, uh, held up as exemplars in, in positive, well, positive or, and or negative ways. The banks, on the other hand, started out very early with providing uh, mortgage freeze and uh, things of that kind and certainly reaching out individually through CRM to, to customers. And that's been very effective. So we're actually seeing much higher ratings around, I'm not planning to switch from my bank um, and I'm speaking positively about my bank than we're seeing in superannuation. The other thing about the super category is you've seen that drop came down and there's been no recovery. So they're in, they're in the dreaded L curve at the moment. Um, and you've probably heard a lot about V curves, U curves and L curves, and no one knows what the curve will be, but this is something that is, is really important. Um, it's, it's superannuation is generally a low engagement category. Right now, it's a very high engagement category. So anyone in that field should be actually making uh, a lot of good decisions about how they communicate. If we go to the next slide, we'll see a couple of categories have done some really positive things. And there's data behind this, which just shows that um, uh, both of those energy and telco are seeing improvements in incontestable loyalty and improvements in advocacy. But what you're seeing here is a very, very direct commentary. The brand statement is unconditional support. It's strong, simple and on target. So AGL boss says the lights will stay on even in the worst case scenario, uh, coronavirus scenario. Um, that's a great statement from a CEO. Um, AGL is not a client, so it's, it's just an example where, and, and behind that you're seeing the energy category is actually holding up very well in terms of consumer perception. The thing about that statement is there's no asterisk, there's no legalese, there's no weasel words. It's very direct and very to you and understanding your concern about not paying your bill and then having the lights turned out or the heat turned off if you live in Victoria. And on the right, we have a, another statement from Optus. Optus offers eligible customers additional data for April in response to coronavirus. That's a really good statement, but it's not as strong as AGL. And then the lack of strength is in the use of the term eligible. Um, and I know I've had plenty of stashes with the legal teams over the years, and we have to be, to be correct about it, but it is somewhere between those, those two things. Now, both of those, area, those categories are doing really well and, and are providing essential services which is very important, and then making brand statements. One of the things we believe will happen over the next three to five years will be a little bit like, um, you know, Daddy, what did you do in the war? The quality of your brand, what your brand statement is at the moment, will live and linger quite a long time. So if the headline around you is, as the AGL one is, that will have a strong positive um, brand halo for quite a period of time, whereas some other brands in the marketplace are getting some very bad uh, um, earned media, from uh, in terms of descriptions, I mean, it's not great if you are the Trope University to be telling the world that you're going to go bankrupt in four weeks. I'm sure that's not true, but it's a headline. Um, so in there around managing the message, but also around the brand statement that you uh, can or cannot make. And the brand statement needs to be, as I said before, unconditional. It needs to echo with the right things that... Um, that your members, customers, consumers are, are looking for, that, that Australians are looking for. So if you move to the next slide, um, 
So what we're seeing here is the same emotions we've again. We've got the benchmark. We've got um, the um, the branding week one. We've also got there what happens when you mention coronavirus. So the issue about talking about coronavirus is something that is probably best to be left alone. I, mean, I think initially there was a lot of need to communicate um, very importantly about what was going on. But now there's actually, it's not about not mentioning the war, but it is about being um, really thoughtful about the kinds of messages and resonance that it has and not being tone deaf um, and making sure that you don't sound as though you're exploiting a situation, but that there is actually some some genuine um, transparency uh, in terms of what, what you're talking about. The final one around in terms of, of behaviours um, that we've seen through the through the uh, looking at this normality index over time is on the next slide, which is um, related to the importance of customer cohorts. So one size does not fit all. The top line there is young people um, who have been hit really hard in the initial stages in terms of the economic impact. Um, the uh, 25 to 34, it's actually, I mean, the 18 to 25 is even worse, but the 25 to 34, and this is around their in, intention to um, this to, to stay loyal to their superannuation area. And you can see this in a number of different ways. But what you can see is almost some counter cyclical approaches depending upon the age group. So, you know, when, uh, when the 65 pluses, which is the bottom line, go high, the other guys go low. Um, so we're not seeing the same kinds of responses we're seeing quite different responses. Another good example is in domestic travel. Um, domestic travel has come back very strongly. There are a lot of people wanting to go, but really peaking in the over 65s, which you can imagine from grey nomads being stopped to go travelling, um, and differences in those cohorts. So when looking at your market in terms of why are they anxious, how do we assuage anxiety, how do we talk to them, it's also, it's not them, it's groups of them depending upon what business that, that you're in that you need to be to be thinking about. So if you have a, a segmentation or a sense of, you know, who your addressable market is and what the key categories in that addressable market are, your messaging might need to be different. Um, I'll just continue with the superannuation example because I've mentioned it before, but there's a very different message to give to someone who's 36 and, and has just lost their white-collar job, who's 58 and was looking to retire, and who's 18 to 25 or 25 year old. So what you're talking about there, because they've got very different periods of time to be um, using using the product, um, you probably should be talking to them differentially anyway, but even more so in this case, because their behavior has changed so much. So just moving now to, so where are we now? Um, if we um, flip to the next, uh, the next slide, um, we're basically talking about a situation where, yeah, if we just go to the next one, thanks, Em. We're talking about a situation where we've been 11, 12 weeks in this kind of restriction. I'm still having a bit of trouble getting the next slide. Sorry? Can, uh, there's nothing there. There's no other slide. Um. There's a whole, yeah, there's another, there's another quite a few slides. Uh, do you want me to share from my end? Yeah, can you do that? Sure. Sorry, guys. Um, I'll just remove mine. Sorry about this. We just got a bit of a technical issue. It's very strange. The presentation <coughs> that you sent me only has 14 slides. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to share. Sorry, guys. So down can the bottom. That, can you see that screen? No, down the bottom, can you see something that says share screen in stream? Yeah, okay. Yep. So if you use that, it should work. and then you need to add it. Yep. Technology, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's, great <laughs> it? it's not so great when it doesn't. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have a button. I've got share. Share your screen. Entire screen. Share. Okay. Are you seeing anything as yet? No. Oh. You got it now? I've got it, but it's showing your entire screen rather than the presentation. Do you want to send it to me? Can you see it now? Um, Sorry, let me send it to you then. It's easier. Let, yeah. So somebody's just made a comment saying yep. that they, they think the government needs to see this research, um, <laughs> doing any work with, with the government around all of this stuff. Like who, who are the clients that you're working with? Uh, we don't work a lot with government clients, although we've actually started asking some government outcome questions. So we've looked at levels of trust in federal, state and local government throughout mm -hmm. this period. And we've done that by state. So Western Australia have the highest trust in state government, which is not surprising. Um, and we've also started doing a trust model around government. So, yeah, we are we are starting to look at actually extending that out to the government area. Um, yeah, so I'll just attach this file. Okay. So what you we we're gonna do this at the end, but we can we can just yeah. go with it, Diane. Um so what what is it what type of work do you do? Like what does the typical client look like and how do you help them? Um we work across a number of uh, industry sectors. As I said, we've got about 85 people in the um organization. And so we, we have, we're focused around um, those industry areas and we very much work around uh, markets, brands, consumers, competitors, um, and we have uh, two practices, one very much around, you know, new, new brand and the other one is around customer experience, um, which is obviously a, an extremely important thing um, today in terms of what people are doing. Um, and in that, we use both qualitative and quantitative uh, research, which is um, pretty important. And uh, we, hold on, sorry, I'm just, I'm just multitasking. I'm sorry that's about that. Right. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's really fascinating, though, looking at this research and how how it can be used um, from a branding yeah. perspective. I think that a lot of businesses have have gotten it wrong and um they're rubbing people up the wrong way and they've they've missed the mark and then there's definitely some brands that are just killing it and um have really taken people along for the journey and made them feel like um yeah you know, i think a warm hug. yeah i think one of the things about our business is we're very strong on evidence-based decision making but we also believe that the evidence is only going to work if you've actually got a really strong understanding of the human behaviour and the human interactions behind that. So it's not just data driven, it's it's data, you know, it's, I guess it's evidence based um, opinion, but it's always starting from a view of understanding the motivations and the, the, the basic consumer needs. In recent years, there's been much more focus on artificial intelligence, building algorithms, all which is very good because most of the time, 90% of the reason why we do what we do is because of what we did yesterday. So the past does predict the future. But um, there's, at the moment, it's almost going back to uh, a sort of Maslow's hierarchy. What we've seen in the initial stages of this process is people reverting to looking out for me, my family, my job, my community in that order. And um, a great growth in, in is what we call essentialism. So what is essential to me? And we've seen this by doing the qualitative work we're doing at the moment, which is, as I said, a form of rapid ethnography where we get a very deep contextualised understanding of a small number of people um, around that. If you just go to slide 14, yeah, I think you've got a PDF, but um, it's still, it'll oh, still work. Hang on. It's just still loading. Okay. So, um, guys, we will get there. So where are we up to? Keep going. Yep. Now, here we are. This is where this we are. Fine. Here we go. The interim normal. So I'm very, I do apologise for that, uh, guys. Uh, one of those ones of, of um, technology beating us. Um, 
So where we've come from is discussing, you know, our our exploration over that period of time, which we did, as I said, for our clients, but also more for ourselves because we are students of consumer behaviour. And this is a completely, uh, you know, unprecedented, I know is a cliched word, but um, human experiment on a, on a very large scale. So we believe we're now in the interim normal. So we're adapting and normalising. The human psyche likes to have things normalised. We do like to uh, avoid too much uh, uncertainty. And so you saw that happiness and love and things that came back quite quickly as we started to work out how to normalise. Some of the things we did, um, you know, sourdough starters, um, cutting our hair, uh, doing a lot of DIY. So we started to try to make the most of what we had in front of us. But we don't believe this is the new normal, whatever the new normal or the next normal, what some other kind of normal might be. Um, but we're also changing. So if you've got to look at the next slide, thanks, Em, that in reorienting to the new normal, what we've got at the moment is a, an interim normal that we're sitting in right now. Um, and what is interesting about this is this is a forced behaviour change. This is not something we put our hands up for. We've been told to go to our rooms and we're sitting there and we are basically try and we're working from that place and we're adapting. So as I said at the very start, this is all of us. This isn't just them and us. This is not business looking down or government looking across. This is for every one of us is, is in this experience. Um, and it's a human challenge and it's a business challenge and it's a community challenge to how we go. So the outcome is that our behaviour has been changed, whether we like it or not. We didn't put our hands up for it, and I deliberately have got has been changed, not is changing. Um, you know from all the, the research that it could be anywhere from three weeks to three months to a 1,000 repetitions to change a habit. And we do know that actually changing my behaviour is more likely to then pull through my, um, my uh, feelings and cognition. Um, so it's the, the changes that have been put in place for us have been constrained by the pandemic. Um, but what we want to know is, so what's going to happen in terms of when those constraints are lifted? And as a result of those 12 weeks of living and behaving differently, are we going to be different afterwards? There's a lot of debate about this from people saying everything has changed and the sky's falling to those saying, actually, it's all just going to snap back, stop being such an hysteric and just wait a while for that to happen. On the other side of the page, you've got the economic downturn. And um, so still on the same page, thanks. But Basically, we, you know, I said at the start, and we saw it yesterday, we were at you know, 0.3 down on the first quarter, um, first sign of recession in 29 years. So many people listening to this will never have experienced in Australia without recession. Does that mean we're going from relative opulence to relative austerity? And what does that mean in terms of um, the change? So the outcomes, you know, our values will change. So we've had our behaviours being forced to change by the, the um, pandemic and restrictions. Our values will tend to change not that we get new values, but that we get a, a change in the hierarchy, uh, particularly confronting, you know, opulence to austerity. What does that mean? If I'm thinking about going to university um, in the next, you know, years or investing in some kind of thing, am I going to be thinking differently around what I need out of that investment? Am I thinking harder about those kinds of investments? And I think one of the things we really interesting from a business perspective and a government perspective is we really haven't in Australia had much experience of recessions in recent years. I was living in Hong Kong when the GFC hit and it hit brutally, you know, in the banking industry there. I also worked in the USA five years after that where the evidence of the GFC was still, you know, the 2008 GFC was still very high. Any time I went home to Australia, it was relatively soft. What we do know is that economic recessions leave psychic hangovers and psychic scars in terms of my feelings about how much that I, I want to... Um, spend money. So what we're doing on the next slide is just looking at, um, you know, so the key question around consumer behaviour is what about this new reality is temporary versus long term? And how much is it short term tactics and long term strategies? And it's both. Um, no one company is just going to be looking at one or the other. We've all been working in the short term tactics space in the last few weeks and the weeks to come. All the restaurants who are doing takeaways, all those kinds of things. Um, are, are some of our uh, very high-end restaurants going to continue providing dinner at home as well as uh, as in the restaurant? Who knows? That's the long-term strategy side of it. So the next slide, the big question is, you know, what will stick and what will slip? What's enduring? What's transitory in terms of what we're seeing? Because that makes the difference to a uh, 30, 60, 90-day plan versus a three-year plan um, that we might be pulling out. 
And the following slide just, just raises that question around change. And um, resistance to change isn't actually a negative thing. It's fundamentally around creating uh, consistency and reliability and, and managing the world that we live in. And we live in a slightly false sense of security about the world we live in. And it takes a pretty big thing being thrust to make a change. The question here is around how powerfully has this COVID, um, you know, thrust impacted and, and started to shift the way that we think and feel. And on the next slide, what you'll see is um, the questions to be asked. If you're looking at a COVID consumer lens, so we're unashamedly looking in from the point of view of, of being a consumer, being an Australian, basically. So what is the... Um, for all of the things that I'm doing as a business, if I need to apply that that COVID lens, it doesn't mean I necessarily need to change, but it's lacking prudence if you don't think about it in terms of that. So what was the consumer behaviour change? What is the consumer behaviour change? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But, you know, what are the demand shifts? I know in our business we're looking really hard at, you know, what would be the demand shift? So one of our clients was is, actually, Virgin Airlines, um, very different... Um, set of business coming from Virgin in the next little while, i.e. nothing at the moment, but what will happen in, in the second half, you know, of, of the next financial year. So where where are, they, where are the dollars going? Are people saving them? How do we get them to spend? Um, all of those kinds of questions. And the alignment of the current marketing strategy to the new normal. So if you've got a marketing strategy, a business strategy, in fact, um, what are the trends you're seeing out there in your categories? How how do you align what you had there as a market strategy to the new normal? And are you engaged in in offer optimization and or renewal. So are you renovating? Are you actually knocking down and rebuilding? Um, and I think, as I said, uh, in the in the interval when we had, uh, had the tech hiccup, was we needing to go back to basics in terms of really understanding that human motivation um, and reviewing and rethinking, because we can't now say, you know, what happened yesterday is what I'm going to do tomorrow. Often we do research, large surveys, you know, as, you know, we talk to people who've made this purchase in the last three months or the last six weeks. Um, that's actually not relevant to what I'm needing to look, look at and think about today. So whatever business you are, whatever part of the business you're in, it's very important to think about the issues. What has changed, if anything, in terms of that? So on the next slide, we've actually generated um, a number of, of consumer scenarios. And what you've got there is two axes. One is around behaviour change and one's around value change. And so on behaviour change is from low behaviour to high behaviour change and on uh, value from low to high. And we're hypothesising that there are potentially four different things that can happen in a market. No one business will be in one box. It's going to be a combination. So you could get that V shape, which is a snapback. You've taken all the constraints off. I'm snapping back to there. A lifestyle shift might be that actually my values haven't changed, but the way I'm, I'm, I'm achieving that has changed. I've been using something else. So, for example, I've been working from home for 12 weeks. Do I really need to be in the CBD office five days a week going forward? The answer is no, and I won't be. My values haven't changed. I'm still doing the same job and I'm still delivering, but I've learned how to deliver in a way that's actually probably more convenient for me. On the uh, box next to that around transformation change, that's really around the relationship between values and behaviours changing. And that's the kind of, you know, all bets are off box. That's like we could reimagine and recreate um, a new way of, um, of meeting particular needs that are different from what they are, they are now. That's a fairly rare environment, but COVID actually has created some of that. And that's an opportunity box for people to think about um, as businesses is there any threat to me from somebody coming into my market in a different way? Or is there um, opportunity for me to go into someone else's market or, in fact, make um, my the delivery of my offer different to meet different kinds of views? And in the bottom box there, you've got the mind the mindset uh, shift, which is really where, um, you know, a good example is if the economy is difficult, the frugality comes in. I may have had a, an, um, a value around um, set and forget in terms of buying insurance, et cetera. I may now still need that security need, but I have a greater need for frugality. So I'm going to downshift potentially. And I'll go through, just have a couple of examples of what they look like on the next page. Um, what we've got here, um, just on the next slide, thanks, Em, is 
an example of snapback, so going back to the football or going back outside. We know that there, you know, there's still plenty of Australians. I know the AFL talk about how it's ruining the the, the year, but as a as an avid West Coast Eagles supporter, I am from Perth, so it's all right. Um, as an avid football supporter, I know I'll be back at the football as soon as I can, and I'll be watching it. But it's not just about the snapback there; it's also around the um, being with people. So whether it's going back to the to the bar or to, a, to going out to dinner. The thing about this snapback space, though, is that there will be some kind of minor adjustments that need to be made because we know that we are still feeling a bit nervous about being out in public with people. So the ability for um, the, the, the environments where you can snap back to make sure that I'm feeling safe becomes a really important thing. So people in these categories need to hang on through it to adjust at a very kind of micro way the conditions of being in my space and make me feel safe because my anxiety there is just around the health one, but I absolutely want to get back into where I was. If look at the next slide. This is where we've got a lifestyle shift. Now, I know Matthew McConaughey was not in the book club, but nevertheless, it's a good slide. What we've seen is a lot of the baby Zoomers um, have over 70s have embraced technology, not because they like technology. In fact, many of them didn't like technology, but they've been shown how they their, their need is to read a book and talk to their friends about it or see the grandchildren or engage in other ways with family. And at the moment, the way they can do that is through is through digital and through online. So what that means is digital has become new normal. It's not necessarily a, um, you know, a laggard area or anything of that. There's great opportunities there. It, there are threats if you're, if you're online offer, your digital experience isn't as good as the markets because your consumers won't be judging you on you versus your uh, direct competition. They'll be judging you on you versus anyone they deal with digitally. What is that? Is there a new market here for um, for baby zoomers? Um, making sure that it's extremely transparent what they have to do and how they manage things. If you go to the next slide, um, M, the downshifting. So this is basically where you've got that change in values. And so now I've, um, I'm more frugal. So if I was someone who used a premium brand, if I feel that the functional equivalent of the next brand, I'm getting exactly the same kinds of things. Um, is, is enough for me, I'm going to be less concerned about the ego uh, need fulfillment of being with a premium brand and actually the more prudent position of being with a downshifting brand. We're not suggesting here that people should think about discounted prices and cheap Charlies. It's not about that. It's around the value proposition. So if you are a premium brand, you can remain a premium brand, but you might need to focus much harder on understanding um, how to present your value proposition so people can really get the net benefit because they will be looking at net benefit going forward. And the final one is the um, transformation phase, which is really a great photograph of somebody sitting at an airport with the with a Zoom start statement behind them. And uh, again, we're not talking about Zoom as a brand here, we're talking about it more as a sort of generic thing that we're all using. Opportunity and risk in this quadrant. Um, opportunity you can take, risk if someone else takes it from you. It's the all bets are off and it's an exciting quadrant for you to be thinking about in terms of what happens next. So the last couple of slides are just sort of pulling it together. That we're saying beyond the interim normal, there's a sort of action plan that's required. No one wants to be that boat sailing off the edge of the planet. We're actually looking at how do we reorient and we reorient through understanding qualitatively and quantitatively what shifted for us, what hasn't shifted for us, should be done quite quickly to feed into your scenario planning. So your scenario planning may be at the moment lots of logistics, lots of things from inside the business, thinking about uh, things at a fairly uh, high level. You need to come back to basics as well in terms of where are your buyers, your consumers, how are they feeling, how do I communicate to them? That scenario planning then enables you to understand whether there are parts of your offer which are snapback back and whether there are ones that are, that are major functional equivalent shifts and what's your action plan there in terms of reframing or rethinking your offer uh, as we go. Just a word on the next page is, um, again, probably a, a favourite of mine is that as Henry Ford Apocryphy said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, I would have given them faster horses. This is where it's important from a research point of view not to ask people what they want because they don't know, but actually to use inferred methodologies Quantitatively, that is statistical analytics, but qualitatively, it's using linguistic and semiotic analysis to understand you know, the woman bringing the accent. What does that tell us about how she's feeling, where things are going, looking at what people say and the way they say it and the actions and artefacts around it? 
because it's um, very important. That's why we use an anthropologically grounded approach to, to qualitative research because there's a very strong social desirability bias. People want to give you an answer, but uh, unless you give them, unless you get enough richness and context around it, you are not going to be able to discern what will slip from what will stick. And we're doing a lot of this at the moment in terms of understanding some of those things. And we're definitely seeing that digital is the new normal and um, a, an increased enhanced desire to, to be uh, prudent and to have some long-term security in that. Final slide there, M, second final slide, is uh, the steps to a customer first rebound are actually understanding the shift in the market. And I think that's been sort of really understanding more than normal because we've had this experience for all of us. It's, it's not just, you know, snapping back all over the place. There's been some fairly profound shifts um, once you've done that thinking and work and whatever the data, the work we're doing is actually for the market. We're not doing this for any particular client, so we're sharing this very openly. Um, then reviewing your strategy and your value proposition to the consumer um, or to your constituents in whatever way they are and your employees. You know, what's important to them and how do I reframe that in terms of the way we're working? It's created much more a need for a person-to-person -person voice um, uh, not a slick marketing voice, not a paternalistic voice. So understanding the value proposition driven by what's what's rationally required and what's emotionally required. And then pressure testing your current offer, your current experience and your current brand positioning against those things. So those are the things that are at, at a high level important. And the last slide on this is, because we're in this interim stage at the moment, is do all of this with rigour at pace. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to hand back to Em and any questions from the group. And again, apologies for the snafu with, um, with the pack. Really sorry about that. Thank you so much, Diane. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I could listen to you talk all day and I, I love research. It's amazing. It's so powerful. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. So uh, Jesse has asked a question, do you feel that the economy will recover when normality recovers? Um, I think our, our research would show that a normality will recover when the economy recovers. So it's kind of flipping it the other way. Um, it, it is really an important, um, you know, threading that needle is super important because as you'd know from anyone who's a, who's a, you know, a student of history, um, runs on banks in the depression, runs on toilet paper are all coming out of the irrational high anxiety area. So it's quite important to sort of fake it till you make it in terms of confidence in the economy. I think it's not helpful to have a lot of, you know, um, fear and trepidation. But on the other hand, you need, I think the McKinsey guys are talking about bounded optimism. People don't believe extreme optimism. Bounded optimism is, is grounded in reality. So I think it's a really good question. They're going to come together as it's a chicken and egg kind of question because as the economy rebounds, we will feel more normal. As we feel more normal, we'll spend more. So that will make the economy rebound. So sorry, it's not a, a I hope that wasn't too political an answer in the terms of, of around, but it is what we're, that's where the um, agility and, um, you know, the ability to live in the grey at the moment is very important for anyone in an organisation. We do like black and white, we love it. Um, and we're just having to live with this kind of uncertainty in a way we haven't before. I know you're probably all setting budgets for next year, we are. Boy, that's a tough, tough thing to be doing right now. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. It's um, seeing how businesses have very quickly pivoted and changed their product offering, I think has been really exciting. And I think that this type of scenario brings a lot of innovation. I read yeah. I read this article about the amount of businesses and amazing organisations that were created during the global financial crisis. So I think that what we're going to see as a result of this is some really amazing changes in the way we think about products and services, which is a fantastic um, opportunity. And I think it's fantastic for consumers because we're, we're the ones who are going to win from all of this and I think it's really keeping that positivity up and if you are a business owner seeing it as an opportunity not as a threat is really important. Yeah and I think it's really interesting too and very very important for businesses and for any organisations to think about stop trying to hold on to the past. What we're seeing at the moment is about 
80% of Australians think it'll be six months or longer before we return to, quote, normal, whatever that was. But now we're seeing 20% of that 80% believing we'll never be back to normal. That, and we're actually investigating that right now, so happy to share that as we go forward. But um, we think that's actually around, we're seeing a lot of people seeing the silver lining, and I don't mean in a Pollyanna way, but actually significantly more time back, etc. I don't want to go back to what I had before. I want something better. So hanging on to that, um, sorry, thinking that one through, and it's quite complex, what does a hybrid workplace look like? How much room do I need for people? It's quite, it's quite a, a tough ask. But, but no one, not no one, there's an increasing number of people who are going, yeah, I'm actually enjoying some of these things and I want to retain those, but I want to get some of those other things back. So you're right, Emily, It's we do have clients, some of whom have actually moved really fast to start creating recession-proof offers, um, to start thinking differently from the way they were thinking when they did their strat plan last year. Um, and then we have other clients who clearly are really not wanting to let go of the big strategy. So you're going, if you don't let go of your big, if your big strategy still works, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you have to be really thoughtful um, about that and, and give it a really strong shake, um, you know, a reality check. Yeah, you don't want to be a Kodak, right? No, or a ground phone <laughs> company. <laughs> it may be a good idea, but no one else is with you. <laughs> Amazing. We don't have any other questions except Kathleen has said that there was an issue with the Facebook video. So um, it, this has recorded. So we will be sharing it with everybody via email. And I guess the final question, Diane, is how can people find you and, and get in contact if they'd like to learn more? And what's coming next from you guys? Okay, so so we're a Melbourne-based business, but we work nationally. The business is 26 years old, and so we've got about 80 people on staff. And we have, um, uh, yeah, we we're we're available at, at forethought.com.au um, if you ha have a look there. Um, and we, as I said, we do a, a wide range of research across a wide range of um, industry groupings, um, from services through to retail. I, mean, I spent three years at Coles and love retail, so quite quite a quite a diverse. Um, uh, area and background. In terms of what we're doing next, next week we're putting out a 10-week wrap, which is a sort of a pulling together of all of what we've been talking about this morning in a bit more detail and also continuing to do our rapid ethnography. So we've done some sessions last week with um, 30 to 45-year-olds. Next week we're talking to 18 to 25-year-olds, 55 plus. And the rapid ethnography is a sort of process over a week of them keeping diaries, uploading videos, and then coming together in, a, in an online environment um, where, where we've actually already know a lot about each other before we get there. And that's really helping us understand uh, and looking uh, at the way that they are talking about things, understanding the things that we really believe are, are cognizant and coherent with their values that, that will stick. And so we're starting to, we will be communicating around that too, and particularly around, we started with finances, not so much for the financial industry, but because that's actually really core to an economic um, uh, turn down. So we're definitely, um, we're really uh, enjoying this work, um, not not enjoying the situation, but for anyone who's a student of human behavior, having a full experiment of this kind is something that we should all be really looking at, both from the point of view of being the, um, the rat in the cage, <laughs> being an object of the research as well as a subject of the research. We believe very, very strongly in doing that. So that's where we're going with this and we're very happy to keep people um, updated and informed on what we're doing around this, this work. Amazing. And you can also find Diane on LinkedIn and um, Forethought also on LinkedIn. So if you want to follow their work and, and what they're doing, uh, Diane, that was absolutely amazing. It was so insightful and really important for this research to be done because everybody is wondering what the heck is going on. So it's great, great insights for brands. So thank you so much for joining with us today. We will send out a live, uh, sorry, a recorded version of the video if people missed it. But uh, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate you giving up your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you very much, Emily. And thanks for the opportunity and the opportunity to talk to, to your audience here. Um, we really enjoy the uh, ability to share the information and are always happy to chat through these things. It's, it's absolutely um, 
fascinating and you know having a very applied approach uh, is good to talk to businesses and, and how they can use the information that we're putting forward thank you amazing thank you thank you very much for everybody who joined us